This is Fantology. You may have heard of us. Hello, high colors, low colors, all are welcome to this special broadcast of Phantology where Jake and I pick up where we last left off in the Red Rising saga. Recently, you'll remember we covered the first trilogy uh, as kind of like a recap overview, and I even talked to Jake into increasing his score of the series a little bit, so... <laughs> I'm uh, something of a, I guess that would make me a copper, uh, kind of a diplomat, good with words. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I'm with somewhat the... of a copper myself. So yeah. welcome, Jake. Yeah, you're, you, you're giving off like uh, very mastermind villain vibes right now with the luscious hair and uh, stroking yes. stroking the kitty. Yes. I can see the kitty's paws uh, popping yes. up. I have my cat here. <laughs> uh, that's kind of like uh, Kavix, right? Kavix has his fox yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Okay. Well, I didn't say it, but we are covering Iron Gold, which is book four of the Red Rising saga. If you're watching this video, you can just see my cat's paws reaching up and trying to get me to give him more attention. So I apologize for that. Um, yeah, you get you got me to bump up the score. And I, I think I'm realizing a lot of the stuff in Red Rising for my second read through was on paper, things were really good. But in the moment, I was not as entertained as the first time around. Like there's a stark difference there. Mm-hmm. But this is different because this is my first time, both of our first times reading Iron Gold, right? Yeah. So we're yeah. back to first time around and we'll see how uh, things stack up from there. Yeah. Well, let's go ahead and just say our spoiler free, broad overview thoughts of this book. And then after a few minutes, we'll go into spoilers and discuss the full book. So do you want to go first telling us sure. your thoughts? Yeah. Um, so I really like the idea of, I mean, the first Red Rising trilogy ends. Most of the enemies are defeated or nullified. And it's like, okay, Darrow can, um, and Mustang can establish this new perfected society like based in freedoms and equality like this is great um and the cool thing about this next book and what seems to be this next series is like really diving into how would that actually play out like what are the actual consequences of everything that happened at the end of the first red rising trilogy like what do those defeated enemies then go on to do what do those that were kind of uh pushed aside what do they do and so I really like the idea of of exploring the actual fallout and like what it is like to maintain a new uh a new government a new nation basically a new state um so all of that really intrigued me um what disappointed me um what was a disappointment for me was most of this book felt like a prologue to that continuing story. Like it felt very, very drawn out for what was essentially just the prologue. Um, I think this book could have been a third the length and it would have been at a good pace. Um, Certain plot points I was very interested in and I really wanted to see what was happening. Other ones, not so much, but everything just took so long to like, to progress. And I, that was, I started this book. Okay. Maybe not started it. Uh, I was reading it from Libby. I had to renew this book five separate times (laughs) to get get through it. I just kept getting stuck. And like, every time I would renew it, I would like read less and less until finally Ryan was like, I finished it, Jake, you got to finish it. So um, and I was glad because honestly, where I was at was like a tipping point into the the plot finally starting to do something really interesting. Um, I don't know. Can we talk about like, is it non-spoiler to talk about the characters involved specifically? Yeah, I think you can talk about yeah. the characters, just not necessarily okay. what happens. So. Yeah. So Darrow's plot line. I wasn't I was not interested from Dar- to get Darrow's point of view at all throughout this whole book. Um, I think there's some interesting consequences revolving around him, but it it didn't really happen. Like I wasn't excited to get back to his. 
Um, similarly, there's a character, Lyra. Lyra or Lyria? I think Lyria. It's Lyria. Lyria. She does nothing. The book, everything happens to her in her POV, and she has a large chunk of the book's POVs, and it just felt like, like she shouldn't like why are we focusing on this character who is not doing anything and just having a bunch of things happen to her it was an interesting perspective um i liked i didn't dislike the character itself it's just the the pacing and the plotting of the book was like why why are we focusing on this right now uh, on the opposite side mm -hmm. there's a new character Ephraim. Ephraim. um i was really interested in his plot line i wish i could have gotten more from his pov and then also lysander was uh really engaging so those parts i was really interested in and i just don't think they had enough screen time in comparison to the rest okay well yeah. th that's that's a lot to take in but i think i largely agree so red rising what i really liked about it was that you can stop at the end of morning star and it's it's a good ending it, it's like a, a pretty happy ending you can kind of mm -hmm. just imagine darrow and virginia just kind of going off into the sunset and forming a utopia for humanity and from the uh forward by pierce brown it seems like he struggled a little bit with the decision to continue on in their story I mean, I, I, I'm i a little surprised by that because it does seem like he certainly left things open enough to continue. Um, but my impression was that it, it wasn't like, uh, you know, a done deal when he finished Morningstar that he was going to continue in this world. But like you said, I'm glad he did. But if you liked Red Rising, uh, the first trilogy, it's not a guarantee you're going to like Iron Gold. And I think that's because Pierce Brown takes on a lot as an author that he hasn't done before. And I think the primary point um, for that is because he has the multiple viewpoints. Before, it's been just from Darrow's perspective, right? I don't think we we had any other yeah. character's viewpoint throughout the first, um, first three books. So this is uh, very unique in that sense. And I think that, you know, Pierce Brown is challenging himself a bit. And like you said, it was slow for me and it was difficult to get through um, the first 50% of the book. And I absolutely agree with you. It felt like a prequel to another trilogy, which is kind of what it is. I mean, there's, so there's three books after this. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like, the odd man out you know you have a trilogy and, and pierce brown or I, I, as far as i know it's not considered like a second trilogy it's just now called the red rising saga so it, it's not it's not officially a prequel but it feels that way and i think that's the weakest point is the development of the characters as well as um I, I think that Darrow does a lot of things that didn't that didn't really feel characteristic of himself from the first trilogy. And that was difficult for me to read. That being said, um, I, I was happy with where it finished. It was an exciting ending and certainly set up the yeah. certainly set up the series well for the next book and i i have read dark age which is the book after this of course we won't be talking about that at all i i, I won't be saying anything you finished about it that book. yeah i finished it Dang. um it, it's it's a long book but i couldn't put it down um spoilers for our next review i, I couldn't put dark age down it, it was four percent a... and <laughs> okay well it, it it was very engaging for me personally um but let's uh let's jump into our spoiler containing review of iron gold unless you have any other spoiler free thoughts um just a lot of people so i have a a coworker who a couple coworkers who really like red this red rising saga as a whole and they all say yeah iron gold is hard to get through but it's worth it and they also mentioned the the multiple POVs being 
uh, an issue for it. And to me, I didn't have an issue with there being multiple um, POVs. I liked that addition. I think it adds a lot more uh, like dimensionality to the universe and, and you can do more complicated plots with that. It was really just some of the POVs just were not entertaining to me. Mm-hmm. But because um, like I said, I really loved Efren and Lysander's POVs. And yeah, but that's it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But. All right. Well, if you haven't read the book, stop listening now. We're going to go ahead and jump into our spoiler containing thoughts. Okay. All right. Well, let's address Lysander first, because mm-hmm. I think we both liked him a lot and felt like he at least personally i felt like his story it was like interesting and then you would have a large gap where it would go to different viewpoints that weren't quite as engaging like lyria's and darrow's i was like i was excited to see what lysander was gonna do because he's kind of like the heir of or he is the heir of house loon and he you, you know, I, I feel like there's a lot of expectations for greatness on him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I love the, like, the idea of him being kind of raised by Cassius. And so mm-hmm. he has the, he has this very unique viewpoint being, uh, he's related to Lauren, right? I don't remember exactly how. He's not, he's not related to Lauren. Uh, um, well, I think octavia's actually maybe he is yeah i think so his mom octavia's daughter is married to lauren's son so yeah i think yeah okay that was it yeah i think lauren is his grandpa okay so yeah so he's related to lauren who's a very different person than uh octavia was but he was also like raised by octavia basically for most of his life and then now raised by cassius who is like somewhere in between all of them and and darrow and so he has this really interesting um like influences on him and i loved how i loved how they didn't make him just feel like one of them like he's his own person and you can but you can see where things are being pulled from um i thought it was i remember at the end of the trilogy thinking oh he's going to be raised to be um like neutral if not like an ally to darrow you Uh know what i mean but it's not like you know he's he despite cassius um seemingly teaching him like the pros of darrow's like new society like he's against it completely he's like okay he was he he was very surprising yeah or for me and like he he almost has like the the idealized like he represents the idealized view of the gold society Mm -hmm. um which is which is good to a degree of the like he really wants to push golds to be better than they are yeah but he's still missing the point on the um exploitation and the uh inequality that way but yeah it, he's yeah. just a very nuanced it's a very nuanced take on it and you're like rooting for him even though he's like you can tell he's being what I think he's being set up to be the main opposition to Darrow and Mm -hmm. Darrow's forces in the future. Yeah. I, I was, I was, like I said, very surprised because it, it seemed like his rationale wasn't necessarily too far from Darrow's own because he believed that the society, like, I guess the theory behind it was sound, but golds had gone away from it. They had like, begun they had failed in recent times to be good shepherds of the other colors so i think he was like believes in like a benevolent dictator to maintain control and maintain uh prosperity for everyone which i i think he can see his grandma had, had fallen away with that being said i did not expect him to go against uh, because the whole book cassius is trying to prevent this war from happening and i i thought it was i thought it was interesting how this conflict in the um in the rim has started and it ends with you finding out that um romulus aura actually knew that darrow had destroyed the the dockyards of ganymede and um 
and, and there were a few times where or there was one time one specific time where Romulus's mom expects Lysander to go save Romulus so they can prevent this yeah. war from happening and then Lysander betrays her I was like yeah. shocked betrays her kills the obsidian or maims him to escape and then delivers the vital information um so that like blew my mind I was like oh my gosh so th- I-, I knew the yeah. war was gonna happen but I didn't expect it to happen with Lysander's help yeah I thought he would yeah I thought that was like oh this is how he's escaping he's freeing Romulus and now he's not gonna be executed but that was a and that was like a very like that's something you would have seen in uh I feel like the first few books like a Darrow plot of like oh yeah. but I know this is even better and I uh-huh. I feel like it worked out better here. It, this could just be my um, interpretation of it, but Darrow has always seemed like very brash and just like, go, go, go. And Lysander did something similar to what he would do in the uh, first books, but it seems more cold and calculated. Like he seems less, yeah. even though he is at the same time giving into his emotions, it feels like, like he wants mm-hmm. the war because he wants revenge against Darrow. Yeah. Like I wonder, I don't know. I I'm not quite sure where I think his motivations mostly lie. Like is it in the idealized principles of the society or is it mostly revenge against Darrow? The mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. such a great such a great uh yeah. plot to read. And I love the ending even though it was very tragic and sad of Romulus Ara. You saw yeah. like what he did was you know, trying like along Cassius's line, trying to protect the um like the rim as a whole because yeah, he it was so interesting his speech where he's like, if we go to war, we will lose because they their god is still alive, meaning Darrow was still alive. Yeah. I was like, oh man, yeah, like, you know, Darrow is on such a pedestal in their view, and then um everybody had this plan to prevent or to like establish his wife kind of as like sovereign beside him and then the wrench gets thrown in it where it reveals because of his because of his honor he had to reveal his betrayal of his honor in killing the the um like the people who had come to parlay for the information and because of that he ended up dying it was it was kind of like a very like touching scene you know where he like goes out there takes off his helmet like yells like i am romulus aura and then tries to get it goes to as far yeah. goes, get all the way to that like statue or whatever and then yeah. falls short and dies um anyways that was an aside lysander's story i think overall was great um surprising and uh looking forward to seeing his story continue and the yeah. next books even though he's being set up as an antagonist to darrow super tragic the cassius plot and i was not expecting cassius to die in this book. yeah yeah that but it was it was he did it in like a cool way you know i am like yeah. cassius albalona my honor is like untarnished right he like keeps mm-hmm. dueling those people killing them and that was like a, a really cool scene although yeah. I mean, are we sure he's dead? Because, like, he's dying. And then... They say, they tell Lysander he's dead. They tell Lysander he's dead, but it was, like, you know, an off-scene character death. Yeah. Yeah. Because he, uh, he, uh, yeah. That's interesting. I... I was a little taken aback because at the it seemed like it was being set up like he was going to be training Lysander like at the end of the book three, he's going to go off train Lysander and then there's going to be like some reuniting with Darrow Cassius and Darrow and like they already kind of had an unshaky like alliance before and I wondered if that would mm-hmm. be like a new kind of like reckoning of like them vying for control of how they think the new republic should go or something like that like i was just expecting some more like tension like a reunion and tension between uh yeah cassius and darrow but then starting this book you kind of see his character is like he's just he's just done you know he 
he is so jaded at the world. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think a lot of it is he recognizes like Darrow did the like flaws with the society. And I think in a different world, he would have supported Darrow in mm-hmm. the, in the rising, but, and just like all the baggage with his family and anyways, I you mean, he's tell- kind of been tr- betrayed by everyone at this point. You yeah. know, he was betrayed by Darrow because Darrow was a red. Darrow killed his, like, beloved brother. He was betrayed by the Jackal, who, like, killed pretty much all of, like, the Bologna family and, like, framed it on Darrow. He was betrayed by, like, I think he was betrayed by Octavia Outloon, or at least she she knew of the Jackal's plot to kill yeah. his family. So it's, you know, it's like, where is he going to go And Mustang, kind of. And Mustang. He loved Mustang. Yeah. She chose Darrow over him. Uh, he, it's yeah. It's kind of a, a tragic story. So it, I so, think it would be yeah. sad if it ended here. I think there's some unresolved things that... I think it would be in poor taste for Pierce Brown to end Cassius's story in this book. That being said, I do think it was nice to see someone so, like just exhausted with his life and Mm -hmm. the world around him being able to like choose the terms of him dying and like go out with honor so and i mean pierce brown has has killed characters off screen like fitchner right fitchner died off screen we basically just see his head as proof that he was dead so it's not unheard of um well let's let's move forward into the into the other characters viewpoints um uh before uh before we run out of time so let's talk about lyria uh like yeah uh, yeah you go ahead you've you've mentioned a little bit of your thoughts on her already i think the pros of what you get from lyria's pov is the idea that again Darrow had the idea of the rising creating a utopia and things still suck for reds. You know, Mm -hmm. it's not like it's, it's not like things are instantly better. It's like, okay, now nothing is familiar and things are still hard. Like things are probably easier than they were before, but ripping people out of their familiarity, you know what I mean? Like it, it, it really complicates things. And then you have the, uh, like the terrorist organizations yeah. I really liked like that world building and showing that nuance. Um, but other than that, like, I think it was just too much of her venting about things happening to her and mm-hmm. she wasn't doing much. And so I don't, I think we could have gotten her POV as like a smaller POV or maybe someone else like viewing the situation and like learning about it from her. Yeah. It just, it was just too long. Like, the only really important thing that happens to her is her getting involved with the uh, kidnapping. And it just takes so long for that to happen. And like all, everything that's being built up up to that point was kind of pointless other than the kidnapping itself. Yeah, so, like, I mean, I feel like you just kind of see her like she's already kind of hard because she's a red who grew up in a mine. Um, but like her like naivete of this new world is just being like hammered out of her right you know like you said they think it's a utopia and then they go to these refugee camps where it's like they don't have food or medicine and life does kind of suck and then the red hand comes kills her family um like thankfully she's able to talk Kavix into like bringing her on a uh, in his household which is like kind of a, a like a little break for her but then Ephraim or Ephraim disguised like shows her a little kindness and mm-hmm. you know she's she just hasn't had enough she hasn't been shown kindness in so long like it, it's sad that finally she's shown kindness and it's just somebody who's using her and betrays her and it was um it, but I, I agree. Her her, her storyline was very difficult to get through, um, until maybe the end. It didn't. It wasn't interesting to me until after, um, or may, maybe when the bomb was go or the 
her like necklace or her bracelet whatever she had like the jewelry from Ephraim that like uh released this gas I think that's kind of when it, it became interesting for me which is pretty much the very end of it yeah yeah and I think it could have been condensed and it would have been fine yeah or yeah I think that was the issue it just there's a lot of not there was a lot of just not a lot happening or things just happening to her. Yeah. I, I don't know. That's kind of, that was my only issue with her. I don't have an issue with her as a character. I think she like is an interesting character and like the, her tragic storyline is compelling if it were done a little bit uh, more efficiently. And I'm excited to see where things go now. Um, but as, as the book ended, I'm just like, I hope she's doesn't continue to be this way. I hope she like, starts yeah. to be someone who affects the world somehow mm -hmm. um yeah wh she's, whereas she just kind of has things happen to her yeah whereas like Efren is similar in that he's caught up in this plot and he's being used and manipulated but he's actually like doing stuff and like mm -hmm. playing go like i th think they have kind of parallel story structures that way where they're kind of just caught up in circumstances and have to like react but her reaction is just like going from one place to another whereas Efren's reactions are like plot driving pieces um mm -hmm. yeah I think that's a really good way of putting it honestly because I think his story becomes interest. It, it started off kind of boring like I was like what's the point of this guy's story um but it it picked up pretty quickly for me even though like there wasn't it, it was like kind of like a heist you didn't know exactly what he yeah. what he was after um and, and so it was it sort of had like a heist feel but without like a lot of the setup that like I think makes the heist like a payoff I, and I I can see where that was intentional to kind of build up the suspense like what what do they mm. need to get that's so difficult and then it ends up being Pax and um what's the name of Victor's daughter? Uh, I don't remember. Um I want to say like dagger or something, but it's not that. <laughs> Electra, Electra, that's Electra. It. Oh, dagger. Yeah. <laughs> is Electra is an Electra a dagger? Uh just in the Marvel comics, she has like oh like the Raphael daggers. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, oh yeah, Electra okay um yeah i i really liked how that like i liked how again showing the nuance of everything like he was a soldier like he you think he would support the rising but he doesn't like darrow because of the waste of life which mm -hmm. is a big theme of like is this justified or not um so i loved that but then he, i also i thought the heist I, were good like i i thought they were compelling and entertaining and i really liked the the mystery of it and how they don't like just tell you right away and we're kidnapping the children like you don't like yeah. you're following them the whole way and then that's like good storytelling for something that is like unique to writing versus a movie is like you can have it kind of be a mystery even though you know they're taking these kids you're like you have to piece together like oh that's who this is that mm -hmm. like this is a huge deal you know whereas yeah. in other mediums like you would see the kids and know exactly usually who they are but um yeah and I I liked how it connected to Lyria's story like I liked his interaction there of like I got to save her and no I got to kill her and then he couldn't kill her so then he had to save her like I liked that like overlapping like seeing people from different uh seeing POV characters from different POV characters POVs mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought yeah. it, I thought it was done well he, he's somebody who clearly has a conscience that he's suppressed and you know he actually has yeah. used drugs to suppress his conscience with um you know the zolodone and so it, it was interesting to see that he like got a conscience kind of at the wrong time for himself yeah. um and uh yeah but he he was it, it's it's cool to see um more of like a gray's point of view because up until this point i feel like they've just kind of been like foot disposable foot soldiers 
in the Red Rising series. So I like that we're getting more perspectives from other low colors. Yeah. Um, and just be. Go ahead. I was gonna say just because of time. Um, if we should we move to Darrow or did you have more yeah. thoughts on? No, that's uh, that's what I was gonna say. Okay. Let's let's finish up with the biggest point of view of all, which is the Reaper Darrow of Lycos. So Darrow's POVs to me were hard to get through for a couple of reasons. Coming coming from a reread, I was already kind of tired of Darrow. And then uh -huh. he makes a bunch of mistakes in the beginning of this series, which I think yeah. were good for storytelling, but made me less interested in his POV just because mm -hmm. I'm like annoyed at the guy. Um, yeah, I was just kind of like hitting my head like, Darrow, yeah. you idiot. Why are you doing yeah. this? And then... And then his plot, like, I don't think his plot line was too long. Like, I don't think it needed to be condensed more like Lyria's probably did. But it was also, like, kind of meandering. Like, you didn't have, like, a clear understanding of, like, I think they could have, like, restructured it in a way where you were anticipating everything, like, they're going to do. Like, oh, we're mm -hmm. going to go free uh, Apollonius. Apollonius. You're gonna go free him and like, not necessarily knowing you're gonna free him like but like we got it kind of like the heist thing we know we have to do a heist you don't know what the heist is until it happens yeah. like i they all kind of did that with apollonius but i think they could have done it better and then like and then going to do the actual ash lord i don't know it just felt kind of like it didn't have like a sense of urgency as much as i thought it should mm -hmm. um in terms of weak uh in terms of like why i think how the book could have been better but in terms of just plotting, like, man, I was so frustrated with Darrow. Yeah. And then with, with, and then with the like, kids. Oh, mm -hmm. God. Well, like, I, I feel like he, like, butchers his job as, like, a father, which you're like, yeah. oh, man, like, you hate to see it. Like, it's, I mean, he's obviously got a lot of responsibilities, but you're like, man, you'd think that Darrow would be a good father. Um, yeah. It almost cheapens. It almost cheapens the fact that in the first trilogy they kind of threw in there they're like oh yeah um you're i mean i can't remember his wife's name but she was at, pregnant yeah at the end like, he learns she's pregnant yeah i kind of feel like it almost cheapens that because he he doesn't like even in the i i think this this was good writing but just bad character <laughs> uh -huh. of um in the beginning like you show him like he doesn't know how to interact with his kids and like severo does you know, yeah. I thought I thought that was an interesting dichotomy there, but yeah, I, yeah, and I I like how you I like how you put that where it's good writing, like it makes for interesting, um, it it makes the story more interesting, but at the same time, it like it almost feels like character assassination in a way, yeah, a like, little bit, not 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 quite, like, um, but to an extent and um yeah and then like his whole like deciding to betray the uh the the senate and like what his wife he and his wife had you know essentially built and and he kind of like put his wife in such a hard position as sovereign i was yeah. like man you're you're so dumb and then it, it seemed like at the end i it, it was it was kind of like oh yeah Darrow was right to do that and I almost wish he like he wasn't yeah. right to do that you know I, I wish like he had been like you know what I should have stayed behind and I I, I should have like there his his acting in that way created more consequences I felt like the book was trying to say he was justified but I didn't buy it like I still don't think yeah. he was justified so I, I wasn't a hundred percent clear. Like when he's talking to the Ash Lord at the end, the Ash Lord almost says, like, oh, Atalantia was going to make peace, but I told her you would never do it. And so and and then he's like, by coming here and killing me, you're driving Atalantia to um never, like, yeah. To never seek peace and to kind of like, you know, wage this war to the end. So I wasn't sure, like. Did he mean that like peace was an actual was an actual option? 
but then at the same time she was positioned to destroy his fleet right as daryl was killing her dad so yeah i don't know i i yeah i think it is trying to say that him killing the ash lord makes sure there's no peace like that isn't possible at all like like you said but it did kind of seem like so, and so that way he messed up, but the initial, the rejecting the initial peace offering, it felt like it was trying to justify that a little bit. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Um, I'm really interested to see how it plays out. I, I get the idea of like wanting to save the, the soldiers if he could then instead of heading back to his kids because he doesn't like he has no idea where they're at, but it felt, I don't know. It felt well, almost contrived for him not to go back to save his son. Like he's he's done other things so much in the past where he's like gone out of his way. Yeah. I don't well, know. It it was interesting because you see like the first like one of the biggest like disagreements where like Severo actually turns his back on Darrow. And yeah. Severo makes like the decision to go to his family and like choose his family over his like role in like the greater scheme of things whereas darrow makes the opposite choice and it's interesting because i think you could make arguments either way Um, yeah but i i do think that darrow like in the past you'd feel like his story he'd like choose to go out of his way to like save one person and then somehow it would work out it would work out for everything else too yeah Whereas that, that's where I'm like, in the past, he would have make, made that choice and somehow didn't this time, which adds more like re- realism, but not, yeah. it messes with the continuity. I was really glad that they had Severo turn his back on him because he always has kind of been ultimately loyal to Darrow. But I think it makes sense that once you have a family, like like those other loyalties, like don't have the supremacy they had before. Mm-hmm. You, you, so. his, his loyalties to his wife and kids supersede yeah. his loyalties to um even darrow yeah yeah which i was glad they uh, like that was a, a cool uh character moment but so overall excited excited for uh um the rest of the series now um i think they this book sets up so many cool things to be resolved i was just disappointed in how long it took to get there but mm-hmm. I think that although the ending was interesting, it was it was hard to get through. And I don't know if I would have been able to push myself through it if I hadn't heard that the next books were worth it. Um, yeah. And so I, I think that this is the weakest Red Rising book so far. And I would probably give it a 7 out of 10. Yeah, it's interesting because I think it has some of the strongest moments in the series so far, but yeah. at the cost of the weakest moments. So uh-huh. um yeah, I would I think a seven out of ten is is about right for it though, for balancing both of those. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, we'd love to hear your thoughts as a listener or viewer. So if you wanna join us on our Discord where we where we talk about all sorts of books we're happy to hear what you think if you disagree agree have some takes where uh maybe we didn't consider um we're on pretty much all forms of social media maybe not super active on them all but um comment on youtube video whatever and um i'm personally really excited to discuss dark age and hopefully ben can join us for that one yeah i'll try to power through that one I mean, you don't need to power through it, but maybe maybe faster than you got through Iron Gold. <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping this one doesn't take more than one renewal. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thanks, Jake. Uh, until next time, more Fantology. Thanks, guys. <laughs>